You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. This episode is brought to you by Pepsi Wild Cherry. Pepsi Wild Cherry is bursting with delicious cherry flavor and a sweet, crisp taste that gives you more to go wild for. Getting wild may look different these days, but whether it's opting for a solo Friday binge watch or a big night out, everyone can indulge in their wild side with Pepsi Wild Cherry, also available in Zero Sugar. So grab a Pepsi Wild Cherry and get wild. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore that ad. I had a yawn hit me right as I was about to start, but you know what? I powered through it because I am a professional. It's what I do. It's what I do. So I have got a bunch of sound clips queued up, coaches and players and whatnot. Um, kind of want to go through those and news and notesy whatnot. Basically, I think the only news you really need to know is, as far as I know, everybody's okay, with the exception of Adrian Amos. Jair is practicing. Uh, Bakhtiari and Elton Jenkins, I think, were not, but it sounds like it was kind of a planned thing. They normally do this. I don't know. But uh, that's that's about that's about that. It sucks because I, I have all these clips of things to talk about, but then I started finding clips of other things, like non-Packers people talking, and I'm really fired up and want to get into it. So maybe we'll just start with that. And if we don't get to the other ones, I guess I don't care. I just wasted a few hours. Big deal. <laughs> I do what I want, man. And what I want to do right now is something else. So I'm going to start off here. Um, I don't know why they don't put like the names below people when they're talking so I could tell you who it is. It's an ESPN panel talking. It's the Get Up crew, so if you watch Get Up, you probably know who this is. But um, just a couple comments, and again, people just say stuff, and I want to address it, partly because Packer fans listen to this, and sometimes they believe it. I don't know. I'm not sure, but let's just, again, let's just say things that are real and accurate, and maybe give some... I know I over-explain things. I know that I do that, because I want to really show my point, but these guys don't explain anything. They just say stuff. And I don't really understand it, but I want to start with this clip here talking about Rodgers and the offense just not really working. Right, and it's, it's, it's interesting. I love the comparison like between Mahomes and Rodgers right now because both of them have what we think as you know supporting men. They don't have any lead men outside of Travis Kelsey. Mm-hmm. But you look at what Mahomes is doing with his new pieces and his parts that aren't the same what he's a, a used to having. And we look at what you know Aaron Rodgers is doing. I think they're going to get better every week, but they have a long way to go as far as being reliable. And if Aaron Rodgers doesn't trust you, just ask Valdez Scanley. He'll get you up out of there. He won't throw you the football. <laughs> Well, look. So again, first of all, we got that whole thing where if he doesn't trust you, he won't throw you the ball. And that, there, there's some truth to that, but he's clearly starting to try to lean on people. He has thrown to Watson. It's just never worked, right? They, they've taken shots. It hasn't worked yet. When it does, then great. But he mentioned something else. You know, the Kansas City Chiefs lost a bunch of guys just like the Packers lost a bunch of guys. He is asserting that the Chiefs are... And Pat Mahomes specifically is capitalizing on the new young talent and the the new pieces around him. In other words, they're not struggling like the Packers are struggling. And in in a macro sense, it seems to be true. The Chiefs are still scoring a bunch of points. But if you just look at it, who are the most dominant pieces that are in Kansas City? Well, if you're talking about points, because they've scored a ton of points, six of their 11 points are Travis Kelsey and Clyde Edwards-Alaire, the running back, and they're obviously tight end one in the NFL probably there's another touchdown from Miko Hardman who was already there and then you know a couple randos Justin Watson who has hardly played at all randomly caught a touchdown pass Jarek McKinnon who is in his second year with Kansas City um, has a touchdown Joe Fortson who's been a tight end for two years for Kansas City of all the new weapons none of them have a touchdown Juju Smith-Schuster does not have a touchdown MVS does not have a touchdown. Sky Moore does not have a touchdown. None of these points that the team is is accumulating have anything to do with the new pieces. And you say, well, it's not all about touchdowns. What about, you know, like going out and doing stuff? 
the Chiefs have, what, 106 more yards than the Packers do as far as receiving. We are at exactly 1,000 yards. They're at 1,106 yards. Travis Kelsey and Juju Smith-Schuster have more yards than anybody in Green Bay. But after that is, you know, obviously a bit of a drop-off. They have four players on their team with over 100 yards. The Packers have five. Robert Tunyon, Sammy Watkins in just two games, Randall Cobb, Alan Lazard, and the number one wide receiver right now, Romeo Dobbs. So wait a minute. I thought, I thought we were the guys that can't figure out how to utilize the new guys, right? Number one wide receiver or number one receiver for them is the same guy it's kind of always been. It's either Tyreek or Travis Kelsey. For us, it's Romeo Dobbs and two touchdowns. So, you know, I, I, I'm not trying to compare offenses. They have a better offense, but the, the picture that's being painted is that both teams are going through the same thing. Pat Mahomes and Andy Reid and that team has to figure out how to make this pile of people work. And they're doing a great job. The Packers are going through the exact same thing. They lost some of their guys and they have the same, you know, what a same situation and they have to figure out what to do and the Chiefs are succeeding and the Packers are not. It's not really a clear picture. Them keeping Travis Kelsey would be very similar to us keeping Devontae Adams and being like, well, I mean, we lost some guys. We lost MVS and, uh, you know, Equinemius St. Brown and stuff. You know, it's, it's just so much misdiagnosing. I'll see if I can find the clip. I had it. Probably got rid of it. Everybody was lighting him up on Twitter. I, I'm actually curious if he continued with this. I'm guessing he recorded it and then put it on Twitter and then got blasted for it. All right, I found it. I think this is it. Here we go. So so this is Chris Sims. I know he's wrong about a lot. I feel like I, most of my biggest gripes are about Chris Sims, which is surprising because he's a formal fo- former football guy. You think he would be better at this, but he's... He's really bad. I, th- I think he's worse than, than Florio as far as his takes. But here's what he said. And again, you probably saw this on Twitter. Here's him saying it out loud. Like, precision and execution, that's like their identity. You know, they're not explosive. They're not dominant. But they execute and they don't shoot themselves in the foot. That's literally the opposite. Right? That might have been the Packers' identity previously. I mean, the, the Packers were not explosive last year. We, we, as far as especially running the ball, there was no explosion. That was the biggest problem, but they were careful. They don't turn the ball over all that stuff. This year, as you saw probably on Twitter, the tied for second most explosive team in football, which is adding 10 plus yard runs and 20 plus yard passes. Now, your definition of explosive might be different than that, that's fine. You can create your own metric. This is not like the gold standard of explosiveness. Could be, you know, 15-yard plays, period. I don't know. Whatever you want to do. But this was a metric that was brought up, and the Packers are very high on that metric. It's the exact opposite, right? This is my problem. People are misdiagnosing and, and mischaracterizing the Packers, and it's kind of stupid. The Packers are not explosive, but they don't make mistakes. No, they are explosive, and then they get down by the goal line and they cough it up, Aaron Jones. Or they get down by the goal line and they botch a snap, Aaron Rodgers, and it gets fumbled and recovered. Or they snap the ball into Christian Watson and we lose like 40 yards. Or Romeo Dobbs causes, you know, has, has a fumble. Or Rodgers throws a pick six. I mean, historically, yeah, this is a team that does not make st- mistakes, but you're you're exactly 100,000% backwards what you're talking about when you're trying to describe the Green Bay Packers. The 2020 Green Bay Packers. Well, I think that's the biggest thing we've seen right now. No. And again, like, you know, I think I, I lean on what he says. Hey, is it sustainable? Yeah, they're going to beat the middle class and the lower class of football for the most part playing this way. They're not going to beat the better teams in football or get to where they want in the Super Bowl. They're not, not playing this way. Not, not with lack of explosive plays and putting pressure on people, but again, he's a hundred percent right, but he's a hundred percent wrong, right? He's right. I mean, this is not sustainable and you're not going to beat the best teams if you don't fix the problems. But did you just say lack of explosion and not being able to put pressure? You are exact. What team are you talking about? Are we like, in the upside down right now, or everything's mirror image. I don't know if that's exactly how that works, but that's what it is. It's you're you're describing the exact opposite of this team. 
They are explosive. They're very good in pressure. They struggle in run defense. And they're causing too many, they're, they're making too many mistakes. It's, it's the polar opposite of everything you're saying right now. Yeah, precision execution. What do you, what do you say, Mike? What do you say, Mike? I don't care what Mike says. Um, beyond that, Aaron Rodgers, and, and everybody's kind of said it. And it's very straightforward what the, the issue is. It's consistency. It's not that they can't do it. And that's, that's what should give Packer fans and everybody else hope. And that's the picture that's not being painted for you. In both clips that I played, it's a grim picture of a team that just has not figured out how to really move the ball properly, explosively. You know, the, the, the first clip I played, played from ESPN, what's the issue? They haven't figured out how to use the weapons they have. That's not true. I mean, it, it needs to further develop, but they are moving the ball down the field. They can't do it consistently enough, and they keep shooting themselves in the foot. The second clip, it is a grim picture of a team that, you know, is, is sort of this, sort of like the New England Patriots. They're very disciplined. They don't make mistakes, but at the end of the day, they just don't have the talent to get it done. That's not it. And the fact that he's going to sit here and say, this is what we watched, like, you watched the game? And you're saying they don't make mistakes? I don't understand. And then going back to ESPN, again, I, I just, I don't know what world we're living in right now. E- either, either I've missed a lot of things and I'm just not seeing what's going on or they're just completely making things up. Here is the next clip. Look, I mean, Mike T, there was something else about those comments when we heard them in our meeting this morning that sort of rubbed you the wrong way. What was that? By the way, this is posted on the 6th which is today for me, yesterday for you. This is not from like a month ago. Yeah, agree. When you add to it the week before when he basically called out Romeo Dobbs and Christian Watson, their two rookie receivers, he's talking about, again, their offense not performing well. That is squarely on the shoulders of Aaron Rodgers. You are coming back to win a championship. You don't have Devontae Adams. In May and June, you should have been picking those guys up at the airport. You should have been having your own walkthrough. You can email them, text them. Greeny, you made the point. That's what... Hold on. First of all, when is he calling out the receivers? I haven't heard him say anything that is that is just not glowing about them. Right? Not Not in a very long time. He's not calling out the young receivers at all. And he's been very... Um, honest about his own play, said this past week he didn't do very well, at least in the first half. Um, and then, you know, the, this... <sighs> Look, the, the whole May and June thing, I, I can't tell you definitively that that wouldn't have made a, a difference at some point, but here's my problem. We're four weeks into the year. How can we sit here today and say that if you had picked Christian Watson up from the airport, he'd be a stud right now. It's four weeks into the season, he's still not a stud. Explain that to me. Of, of live NFL action, I, I would assume one actual game and, and a week leading up to it and game prep and all that stuff is worth months of whatever the heck they do in May. Stretching and meet and greets and running around with shorts on. This is where you learn, and look how long it takes. So, you know, yeah, okay, granted, it would be nice if he say, this is important, we got to get out there, and I want to spend as much time with them as is humanly possible. Picking them up from the airport is stupid. Um, That's ridiculous. I mean, if you want to, fine, but to make that sound like a requirement, (laughs) come on. I don't know. I, I know this is all sensationalized nonsense, but... It's just, it just, it, it feels like we're getting back into off season mode, and I don't understand it. We've got so much content going on right now. We've got so much information. I still don't exactly know what's going on with hardly any team, and things are so weird right now. But we're getting into this point where it's like we're starting to just make things up about the Packers. You know, like this is, that's not right. That's incorrect. I mean, and just basic stuff. Maybe it's just because we don't really have any good answers, so we just revert back to our priors. You know, the the Packers offense doesn't look super great. Well, I'm not going to look into the data. I'm not going to ask any real questions. I'm not going to listen to what they're actually saying. I'm simply going to revert back to what I said prior to the season, that they're going to struggle without Devontae and these young receivers. And and this guy presumably was pounding the table. How dare you not show up in May? And now that the the offense has not been a powerhouse, what's his go-to? Hey, you didn't show up in May. Told you. Which again, I don't know how you can explain Romeo Dobbs having more yards than... 
you know, Lazard missed a game, but how about Randall Cobb? Did Randall Cobb need that time in May? I guess. Text them, Greeny, you made the point. That's what Peyton Manning would have done. That's what Peyton Manning would have done? You know what Peyton Manning would have done? He would have taken his helmet off and bludgeoned one of these guys by now. Peyton Manning was a (laughs) jerk-off. Peyton Manning treated rookies like garbage. Peyton Manning was like the ultimate alpha. You don't step foot in my huddle on my field unless you do exactly what I say. Peyton Manning is the poster child of everything that people think Aaron Rodgers is. The idea that Peyton Manning is like the ultimate, like he's Russell Wilson. No, that's something Russell Wilson would do. Peyton Manning, I mean, it, you know, maybe there's stories of him having done that in the past. I don't know. If he picked him up at the airport, it was to give him a lecture about you either get in line or you will not be playing for me for very long. This, this is what top-tier elite quarterbacks do. I mean, there's stories about how Favre treated people, how Rodgers treats people, how Tom Brady treats people, how Manning treats people. The bottom line is they're, they're at the tippy top of everything, the top of the top of the top, and they're trying to play at the highest possible level, and new people coming in every single year, not knowing what they're doing, and you get to a point where it's like, you know what? Get out of my face. Come back to me when you got it figured out. Go talk to your coach. I'm not going to sit here and baby a new crop of people every single time. Go talk to the coach. Go learn. Go figure it out. And when you're ready, you come in here. Not saying that's the best possible approach, but I'm just saying that's what happens. We're, we're playing championship football out there. This isn't a freaking nursery. Peyton Manning would have done. Get out of here. And when the margins are so small and you're going against Tom Brady and Matt Stafford in your conference and guys like Joe Burrow, Justin Herbert, Lamar Jackson, you have to do everything you can to win a championship. And I just. I'm, I'm, I'm lost as to what's happening. We, we just beat Tom Brady and those other guys aren't in our conference. But yeah, yeah. And, and Joe Burrow's kind of playing like garbage. Uh, Justin Herbert, by the way, probably won't even be in the playoffs at this point, considering the amount of injuries that they're going through. But yeah, I, I, I guess that that's a list of names and, and teams. I think his comments fall short with his actions. In What comments? What comments? Late May and early June. Now this, these... Well, there's no comments. This, this, is, this is fantasy. This idea that Rodgers is just raging and just throwing everybody under the bus. And this is why people believe what they believe, because they don't actually have any idea what they're talking about. Outside of Packers fandom, and probably some people inside who don't, you know, watch Packers press conferences, they get their news from ESPN, this is what you think is going on. This isn't happening. I'm listening to all the press conferences. I've, this last one I, I, that I presumably will be getting to at some point, Rodgers has never been this happy. And especially now, this past interview, I've never seen him so happy in my life. I think it's because they're going to London, he's excited about the trip, but it's just in general. This, this angry version of Rodgers that just hates everybody and, and you know is shunning his, his rookie receivers is nonsense. Did you hear the part where I said our number one receiver in terms of yards and touchdowns is Romeo Dobbs, who really didn't even become a factor in this offense until, what, week three, when they finally pushed him to the forefront a little bit? I don't know. I probably shouldn't even play this because it's, it's so stupid, but um, I'm going to. So the, after that guy spoke... Somebody else said, look, I think Rodgers is a clown and everything, but he has the right to skip voluntary workouts. And then uh, person number one comes they back struggle, in. But they struggle against a backup quarterback. Because it- again, again with the backup quarterback crap. First of all, Aaron Rodgers doesn't play defense, you stupid moron. What does that have anything to do with anything? Second of all, nobody struggled against a backup quarterback. Nobody struggled against the quarterback. They struggled to stop the run. And the guy, the guy nailed some wide open play action passes because we tried to stop the run and everybody was playing run because the last nine plays in a row were, were, were run plays. Rodgers doesn't play defense. We didn't struggle against Bailey Zappi. Good Lord. If Bailey Zappi had to actually sit there in the pocket and pass the ball, if we had better run defense and he was actually asked to do that, he would have gotten annihilated. But he wasn't asked to do that. So... Yeah, number one, we won the game. Number two, Bailey Zappi didn't have to do jack squat. Number three, Aaron Rodgers didn't struggle to stop the run. That was the defense. Aaron Rodgers had a rough first quarter or whatever, which had nothing to do with not being there in May because we just saw the week prior, and we saw in the second half, and we saw all these other weeks, Aaron Rodgers has been elite in terms of his ability to throw the ball. So his first 
half issues had nothing to do with that. This is all stupidity. But that's just the beginning. It's just the first three sentences of this stupid thought train he has. Is he lost that? Yeah, I understand that. But, you know, to, to Tannenbaum's point, like, we compare the GOAT and the BOAT, and you decide who you want the BOAT to be. We know who the GOAT is. The GOAT got kicked out of the, a park in the middle of a pandemic for receivers that he had been working with. So you can't complain about the chemistry and the execution because it's about the nonverbal communication. I don't know what any of that means. We see a lot of, you know, the disciples of Sean McVay struggle early on because they, they go about business a different way. They don't have contact in practice. They don't do a lot in, in training camp. They try and protect their players, but then they get off to these slow starts. Unfortunately for Aaron Rodgers, he can get off to a slow start because the division is not that good right now. The division is not that good. Okay. Uh, we lost to the Vikings. The only other division player we played was the Bears. I'll, I'll let this finish because it's stupid. But they're three and one. They, they didn't get off to a slow. But is start. it a real three and one? We is it a real three and one? Is it? Didn't they beat Tampa Bay? I'm so mad he didn't even bring that up. You know who owns it? It is just three and one. It counts. Yeah, yeah. But, 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 it's but different let me get three and one. Final word. There's different three and ones. Okay, they beat Tampa Bay. Who 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 else could they have played that would have actually been a real win? Who else could they have played? Are, are we just going to sit here and pretend that the Eagles are the only team that matters, and unless you beat the Eagles, nothing matters? Are we just? Is that it? Like, there, there's no other team? What, the 49ers? Are you kidding me? You think it would have been hard these last few weeks to beat the 49ers? The Bears did it. Who? This is so stupid. What are you guys talking about? This is, this is my favorite. It finally came out here. This, this, is, this is hilarious. Yeah, Greedy, if we're, it's, this is about CBA compliance. We can trot out there with a whole bunch of average quarterbacks. If the object of the exercise is to win a championship, and presumably that's what it is since he came back, as Bart alluded to, Tom Brady's out there looking for parks in Tampa Bay to just get a little bit better, and that's where I think it falls short between what he's saying he wants to do and his actions, and that's why they're struggling. They are 3-1, and one, but look who they've played, and that could be the difference when they we get Tom down Brady. to games that matter late in the year. <laughs> Here's what I'll say. <laughs> Did you hear that? He's bragging about Tom Brady does it the right way. He's out in parks just to get a little bit better. And what's Rodgers doing? He's not doing anything. And, and, and that's how you know that these wins aren't even real. They freaking beat Tom Brady. Not only is that the guy you seem to forget about or the team you seem to forget about that they beat when you pretend that their wins don't mean anything. Beyond that, you just talked about Tom Brady being the gold standard and they freaking beat him. You, oh. So now, I, apparently the narrative is, we're not explosive, we can't bring pressure, we're not a real 3 and one team, because we haven't beat anybody yet, and yeah, we beat Tampa in Tampa Bay, which is a, a new thing that the Packers haven't been able to do, but that doesn't even count, because they were quote-unquote decimated, even though they were still favored going into that game, even though the Packers supposedly didn't, were the ones that didn't have any receivers, right? We didn't have Watson in that game, which is a bigger deal than people want to make it out to be. We lost Sammy Watkins after he just had 93 yards. He just became the most explosive player that we had on this team, and he goes out. And this is, I had somebody call Packernet after dark and make this exact point. The media is trying to have it two ways. Before the Tampa game, the Packers weren't going to win because they didn't have any weapons. After we win, we only won because Tampa didn't have any weapons. Oh, okay. I see how it is. We're just gonna we're just gonna keep moving the goalposts around so long as it confirms my priors that the Packers can't do anything. You know, I I I I am so ready for this team to blow up. I'm so ready for it because, you know, as, as skeptical as I've been, I try to at least acknowledge what the situation is. These these are the issues that need to get fixed. But to just write them off is is insane. You, you know, the 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 lack of ability, lack of explosion. I mean, Aaron Rodgers right now in terms of Attempts 20 yards down the field is 11th. 11th most attempts, 17 in the NFL. And by the way, that number is going to go through the roof. You know why it's as low as it is? Offensive line, not blocking well enough, not fully tapping into Christian Watson. And by the way, Romeo Dobbs has that deep threat ability that we haven't fully tapped into yet. We have deep threats. Sammy Watkins, when he comes back, is a deep threat. This team has the ability to be the most explosive team down the field. We have two underdeveloped deep threats and an injured deep threat on our team right now. And he's still, still 11th. By the way, you know what his grade is on deep throws? 93.8. He's number one in the NFL. He's the highest graded deep passer in the NFL via PFF. How about big time throws? 
Number one in the NFL with eight. The second highest, six. He has more than Jameis Winston. I know Jameis missed a game, but is, you know, Mitch Trubisky is number two with six. But beyond that, there's the percentages. Because if you look at the guys with six, Mitch Trubisky had six big-time throws. That was only 24%. Jameis Winston, 27%. You know why? Because they throw more, so they're going to have more. You know what Rodgers' big-time throw percentage is? 44% of his passes. 44%. The next highest is Geno Smith at 37%. If you're wondering what a big-time throw is, PFF describes it as a downfield throw or pass that's into a tight window, a high-value play opportunity for the offense, and a pass that shows excellent timing and accuracy. Here's a very brief description of, of the explanation. For example, when a QB attacks the defense downfield with a high level of accuracy, he has completed a big-time throw. We often say that a great throw beats great coverage, and big-time throws do just that. All right, there you go. Number one in the NFL. I had somebody call in yesterday and kind of ask the question, if you didn't hear it, how does Aaron Rodgers, you know, because obviously he won MVP. Now, this year you're not hearing a whole lot about Aaron Rodgers winning an MVP because of the level of play and all that stuff. How does he compare? I'm not going to go through all the stats again, but it's almost identical. Aaron Rodgers is nearly identical to what he was last year, but I wanted to look at a couple other things. Do you know where Aaron Rodgers ranked last year as far as uh, his deep passing? Out of uh, 42 quarterbacks, Aaron Rodgers ranked 33rd. Right now, he's number one, talking about his grade. But we can look at stats, too. Rodgers right now is 6 of 17, 177 yards, a touchdown, and a pick. Eight big-time throws, one turnover-worthy play. Last year, Aaron Rodgers, 6 of 20, 220 yards, zero touchdowns, and a pick. Six big-time throws, two turnover-worthy plays. I, I guess what I'm getting at is last year, nobody saw a problem. Nobody saw any issues. They said that our offense last year was just fine. There was no reason to be concerned. This year, I think we're manufacturing things. And, and, and I understand even as Packer fans, we look at it and we go, something doesn't seem right. And it, it's true. There are issues. I think largely those issues are summed up in a couple little problems here and there with, with the lack of trust couple little maybe pressure issues where Rodgers is kind of getting jittery behind the line of scrimmage. And of course, there's the whole issue with the guys maybe not being where they're supposed to be. Fine. But if you had to guess, did we have more passing yards last year through four weeks or this year for, through four weeks? Because the answer is this year. Last year, top tier Aaron Rodgers, MVP, et cetera, et cetera, had passed for 897 yards. This year, he is currently at 935 yards. Yeah, but Rodgers is off. He's got three picks already. Rodgers had two at this point last year, and he threw his third one in week five. So if Rodgers doesn't throw a pick this week, fingers crossed, they are three interceptions through five weeks, two years in a row. So again, the, even the idea of Rodgers is just, he's, he's, something's really off. Well, okay, maybe. But I think we need to be really specific about if there's something wrong, what is wrong, because Underneath the surface, there are things that are not only right, they're significantly better than they were last year. Even if you just look at straight up accuracy, 2021 Aaron Rodgers, catchable passes, 85.7. So far this year, 86.1. If you look at on target passes, even after the shaky start he had, well, the shaky week one, and then of course the shaky first half of this game. So we're talking a significant portion of the total season here. Aaron Rodgers in 2021, 77.5% of his passes were on the money, on target. This year, 80.9. He's more accurate so far through 2022 than he was last year when he won MVP. This is via SIS data. And that's even more pronounced if you just look at weeks one through four. I was looking at the entirety of 2021 compared to 2022 so far this season. But if you just look at the first four weeks, even the things that Rodgers got significantly better at as the season went on, those go away. Catchable passes dropped to 81% compared to Rodgers' 86%. His on-target passes were sub-70%. He was at 698 compared to Rodgers' 809 Yards per attempt were significantly higher last year. You know what they were through the first four weeks? The exact same, 7.2 and 7.2. Same thing. Yards per game, 224 compared to this year, 233. And just flat out, if you look at their par and their war, which is just sort of like their PFF grade or their, their overall value, it's wins, ab wins above replacement and points above replacement. How much better are you than the average player? Through this point last year, Aaron Rodgers in 2021 had a PAR of 
12.4 more points above your average quarterback. So far this season, 16.6, quite a bit higher. And remember, this is this is how it started for Rodgers, and he got better as the season went on. So I'm not going to deny reality and, and the issues that exist. I'm, I'm going to hammer it when I see it. But there's also, again, this underlying reality that there are things that are significantly better this year. And, and the benefit, the benefit is, through four weeks last year, there wasn't a whole lot of upward mobility. There's not a whole lot that you look at and go, well, these are the things that we expect to get significantly better. Now, Aaron Rodgers did get better, and a lot of guys just generally get better. And of course, there's injuries that can come up that can derail that. But largely, it's, it's the same guys we've always had playing the same positions they always have. And so there's no real expectation. You know, Devontae's going to slowly get, not really, Devontae's Devontae. He's already maxed out. Aaron Rodgers is already Aaron Rodgers. This year, though, I think we do have some significant upgrades. I think, you know, one of the biggest issues we had last year was the injuries along the offensive line and the constant shuffling. And as Coach Hahn had, had talked to us about previously, offensive line play is all about cohesion. It's about working together for a long time and, and learning little nuances. And, and when you throw in a new guy or you change positions and do all this stuff, it throws everything off and you kind of start over again and having to learn to communicate with each other and all these things. I'm not super thrilled with the pass protection and, and even a little bit of the run blocking, even though I think a lot of it's been phenomenal. But there's every reason to believe if they can just stay healthy. And that's, that's the reason why, too, I'm, I'm not as diehard about we need to change Elton and kick him inside and everything else. I'm not as worried about it because I know Elton's a good football player. And I believe that long term, that is going to be the best solution. Even if this week, maybe kicking Elton inside is the best solution. I'm not saying it is. But even if it is, I, I, I think you need to have a long-term viewpoint. And I think fans are more concerned about the salary cap than the Packers are. I don't think Matt LaFleur or Joe Barry or, well, not Joe Barry, he's the defensive guy, Stenovich or anybody could, could give two craps about how much Elton's going to cost down the line. I think they realize how hard it's going to be to find a new tackle if they decide Elton's not going to be the guy. And to have a premier tackle, how unbelievably important that is. And they're not going to abandon that plan because he's struggled through two weeks, even though we know he's been a premier tackle and we know he's fighting back from an injury and everything else. The cohesion along the offensive line will improve. Romeo Dobbs is continuing to improve. There's every reason to believe Christian Watson will continue to improve. Uh, even Alan Lazard is, is, you know, was not here week one. First two weeks kind of started off slow and then he exploded. Robert Tunyon just caught his first pass. He's coming back from injury. Even David Bakhtiari. Not only is he kind of acclimating with the guys that are there, but he's also coming back from injury and slow. So there's a lot of things that you can look at and say, there's still room for growth here on top of some things already being better. And I don't know if that's, that's true of anything right now, more so than our run game. I mentioned, you know, explosive runs were a serious problem for us last year. Do you want to, you want to know something that wildly illustrates that point? Do you know how many carries of 10 plus yards A.J. Dillon had all last year? Nine. He already has four. He's halfway there through four weeks. Aaron Jones is even more shocking. He only had last year 17. He has 12 already. If we just say the regular season, just because we don't know exactly how deep of a run they're going to have, let's just look at regular season. It drops to 16 and nine. So A.J. Dillon having four is averaging one per game in a season that is 17 games long for them, he's on pace for 17 compared to the nine he had, which is to say he's on pace to almost double it. Aaron Jones, though, Aaron Jones, who had 16 last season, is on pace for 51 carries of 10 or more yards. 51. Do you know what the record was last year? It was 50. Jonathan Taylor did it. Just talking regular season, 50, which is the other crazy thing about this. Compared to everybody else, Aaron Jones ranked 28th in, in explosive runs or carries over 10 yards, 10 or more yards, I should say. A.J. Dillon was tied with 48th. And, and you got to understand, a lot of these guys had significantly less opportunities. Nobody around A.J. Dillon had as many opportunities. Even Saquon Barkley, who's, who's had the exact same amount, it's 211 attempts compared to 192. It's close, but everybody's less. Everybody is less. There's not a single person that I can see that has as many, uh, well, the exception of C.J. Ham, who I believe is a fullback. Point is, they were terrible at it, and they acknowledged it, and they said it. Aaron Jones right now is second in the NFL behind only Nick Chubb. He's tied with Saquon Barkley. Tied. A.J. Dillon is tied for 28th. 
If you look at carries over 15 yards, Aaron Jones is third. He has six. Nick Chubb has seven. Saquon has eight. So, you know, there's there's semi-ridiculous clips, and I'll, I'll play this one for you just to give you an example, because it, it sounds ridiculous, and I'm sure he said it to be ridiculous, but there is something underlying it. There is something more to this than just being kind of ridiculous nonsense. About this offense right now. The only offense in the NFC that I have more faith in is Philadelphia. I didn't say I, that. I think that highly of this offense right now. He's talking about the we're, Packers. We're boxing this unit into thinking that, one, their quarterback's not a Hall of Famer. Because what you still see, and I don't care, no Devontae Adams or not, he could do whatever he wants with the football. He could place in any place that he needs to. We want this offense because everyone's going to say, can they be explosive, right? That, that's what people are going to say. Mm-hmm. Can they push the ball downfield? They're second in the NFL in explosive plays. There it is. Second, their explosive just looks different to us because their explosive is all these moving parts pre-snap and post-snap. They lead the NFL in yards after catch. They're second in the NFL in explosive passes yeah. because they're so RPO-paced. These young players are coming on. I'm telling everybody, mark these, mark these words, October 3rd. This offense is going to be better by the end of the season than when it was last year with Devontae Adams. Wow. Christian oh, Watson. Man. So, again, and everybody's shaking their head and saying that's stupid. And, and, and listen, he says a lot of dumb stuff. There's a lot of things that I've heard him say. It's like, come on, man, you, you can't be serious with this. And, and this is probably one of them. But the reality is he didn't say anything that's wrong. Maybe the prediction sounds crazy, but I just told you. We already have more passing yards than we had last year. We don't have the points quite you know, where, where it was last year. But two things on that. Number one, what happens if we don't have those turnovers? Because those turnovers, with the exception of the, the pick six, those turnovers seem to happen at a time where the Packers offense was actually moving quite well, including the Christian Watson thing where that wasn't even a turnover, but it still killed the drive. We were moving our, you know, again, we're, we're moving. What happens in that situation? Second of all, a lot of the points we had last year were skewed because of weeks two and three, we had 35 and 30 points. After that, 27, 25, 24, 24, 7, 17. There were seven weeks in a row where we really didn't beat the brakes off of anybody. And it wasn't until week 11 that we finally started to hit our stride again. 31, 36, 45, 31. We ended with 37 and 30 against Detroit, even though we lost that game. Things vary up and down, but the opportunity for the Packers as they're ascending now and just starting to kind of maybe sort of hit their stride a little bit, the opportunity to pass the Green Bay Packers offense last year, which ranked 10th, it's not not like the the most dominant offense you've ever seen in your life, but the opportunity to pass them is right there because, again, they went one, two, three, four, five, six, seven weeks without scoring a ton of points. They get a couple heavy hitters here. They're going to be right on track. Anyways, we're going long. Why don't we take a quick break right here? Patreon.com forward slash pack underscore daddy if you'd like to support the podcast directly. Also, please check out Fertile Ground Ranch Discipleship Ministry at fertilegroundranch.org. We'll take a break. We'll be right back. Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news, so don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. What's Us Days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us Days at U.S. Cellular. Exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals, and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. All right, let's start ripping through some of these uh, clips that I queued up just so we can kind of be 
caught up on everything going on in the uh, the Green Bay land. Uh, first up, we've got Adam Stenovich. Several uh, clips here. We'll see if I decide to play all of them. But first up was a question about Romeo Dobbs and our team's going to start adapting to him and whatnot. And uh, yeah. Play Dobbs a little closer at the line of scrimmage if you're going to keep, you know, throwing uh, uh, little smoke routes to him. Or run yeah, out. I mean, it'll, it'll be interesting to kind of see how they adjust. Um, but yeah, I, I could see that happening. Um, good news is he's real shifty and he can get open, you know, versus press coverage. So, um, yeah, he's going to be a problem. I'm excited for him. So, <laughs> and, and that's what the Packers really need to do. And that is sort of the next evolution of all this. And I think that's when the, the floodgates really start to open up. When, when the Packers have that secondary ability to, to adjust to their adjustments, right? Because the Packers are kind of like doing one thing really well as far as like passing and whatnot. But when teams adjust, can you do something about it, right? That's the whole thing with, that's the biggest thing with Christian Watson right now. Teams have figured out, let's just play man. Because it's not going to affect, you know, if, if they put him in jet motion, the only person that's affected by that is the guy covering him in man. Everybody else just stays doing their job. And as long as they're not actually going to throw it to him, which they haven't been, you know, there's a couple handoffs, but, you know, we'll, we'll rally to it. And if they do that once a game, we'll get over it. But you're, you're far better off at this point just playing man coverage against him. Now, you can't do that whole the whole game if you don't want to. Obviously, they played some man, some zone, but that really neutralized um, that that jet motion when you're talking about the New England game because a lot of the time they did just play in, in man coverage. Now, that is the reason they got the touchdown because it, it was man coverage and the guy couldn't catch him with, with the assist of Romeo Dobbs. But the, the, the point is, the next evolution of that is if you're going to man up Christian Watson, we need to make you pay for that. Because you can't run with them, right? So we, we need to see that and identify that. And and they did, actually, on, on one occasion. Um, he just ran up the sideline. In fact, that was the pass that Aaron Rodgers kind of didn't throw very well. And, and you know, he was kind of doing that weird not tracking the ball properly thing. I don't know who to blame that on. Rodgers took blame for it, so we'll blame Rodgers. But I think that was the thing. I mean, they, they he ran his motion. It was man coverage, and he shot up the field. You need to be able to connect on that and hurt him for it. Consistently enough where they're like, all right, we cannot do that anymore. Then they go back to zone. That's when he starts going motion, and they're like, "All right, we have to shift quickly." And and you know, the end linebacker has to sprint to the sideline to try to stay on the outside and not let Christian Watson get the edge, and that just erases him from the equation. It's the same thing with Romeo Dobbs, right? Okay, we we haven't quite tapped into that next step with Romeo. It's been a lot of just screen passes for Romeo Dobbs. A little bit of this, a little bit of that, but mostly the the damage has come with the screen passes. So the question was, what happens when they start manning him up and, and stop giving him so much respect down the field and kind of get in his face? And his answer was, you know, he's going to be a problem, which is a, a great answer. But th- that that's the point. Uh, they're going to adapt to our guys when we can hurt them for doing that because they're playing them this way for a reason, right? They want to play off because they respect his speed, but they didn't respect his shiftiness enough, and they assumed that they could rally to the ball. Da, da, da. It's going to take somebody to come along and say, you know what, we're going to try something different. We're, we're going to get up in his face and see if we can – get off of press, see if he can get off of that jam and get down the field and actually do something with it. We're not going to let him just steal those yards. So do we have the personnel to hurt him? And the answer is we do. We just need that level of consistency to be able to say when when we attack you the way we need to attack you, it, get ex- it gets executed properly. But that that again, that's in my mind when the doors are going to blow off, when it's just a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. Um, some comments about Christian Watson, which I abbreviated at C Watt, which I don't think I'll ever do again because that just doesn't seem like a thing I should put. Adam, I know, you know, going back to college, Christian was used in a lot of those different ways. Mm-hmm. You know, some of the jets, just, what kind of dimension? That's obviously built into the offense already, but with his kind of speed, what, what does that add to it? Yeah, it's add? huge. Any any time you can get a player with explosive ability like that, um, you just got to find different creative ways to get him the ball. Um, so I think. You know, as we keep going, hopefully we can just keep feeding them and see some cool stuff from them. Sorry about the audio quality, by the way. I can't really, con- that hissing is on their end. It's not my stuff. But again, and I, I'm a broken record here, but the thing that I like about the rookies is that our team really likes the rookies. You know, when asked about Amari Rogers, the answer was what? He returns kicks for us right now. When asked about Christian Watson, the answer is we need to find ways to get that man the ball because he's electric. When asked about about Dobbs and people, you know, you know, maybe pressing him at the line, there's almost a chuckle going, "I dare you," because he's a problem, right? They're they're going to give you coach speak, but there's also an, a vein of of truth behind all this. Here are some comments about Elton Jenkins and maybe what's going on with his slow start. So how much of, of Elton's, you know, ups and downs 
are coming off the injury and how much of it is playing a relatively new position? I think it's a little bit of both. Um, I think mostly it's just him just getting out there and feeling comfortable and just going through it. And um, it's, it's, like I said, there's going to be some ups and downs. But one guy I'm not worried about is Elton, just the way he prepares every day and his mindset. Um, you know, I think he's only going to get better every week. And, and you know, again, I, I kind of got sucked into that put him at right guard thing too because that's probably what's best for today and everything. But, you know, the, the more you think about it, and, and they, they've been very open, and you're going to hear comments about it. Uh, in fact, the very next clip is seemingly – showing and and I think the head coach as well as Aaron Rodgers kind of kind of talked about it um sounding like they're very open to possibly moving him inside soon possibly even this week I had that thought too where it's like I wonder if they're they're not quite being honest about the fact that he could be starting at guard this week and and that's like a big surprise but you know the the again the point is we're kind of getting carried away in the nuance and not seeing the big picture that Elton Jenkins really does have that premier ability that other guys don't Elton Jenkins and Yash Nyman are not the same, not in any capacity. Yash is a very, very talented uh, backup. Elton Jenkins has the ability to be a premier tackle in the NFL, which is really hard to find. And, and it, not that being a premier guard is, is less important, but look at the success the Packers have found by just taking mid-round swings at, at guard. That's how we found Runyon. That's how we found Royce. And by the way, we have Sean Ryan and Zach Tom waiting in the wings, two more mid-round guys. But finding a premier tackle, not that you can't, maybe Zach Tom is one, David Bakhtiari was a mid-round guy, but generally speaking, it's it's first round or bust for these guys. It's hard to find really premier tackles later than the first first round, first couple rounds. It just is. You know, the the uh, number one tackle in the NFL right now plays for the New York Giants. We're gonna we're gonna see him soon. Andrew Thomas, early first round pick. Took him a couple years, but he got there. Second best uh, offensive tackle is uh, Rashawn Slater, pick 13 overall in 2021. Third best offensive tackle, Tristan Wirfs, pick 13 overall in uh, 2020. After that is Trent Williams, who is a fourth overall selection in 2010. He's 34 years old, still killing it. But again, fourth overall pick. After that is Laramie Tunsil, 13th overall pick in 2016. Man, if you got the 13th pick, you better pick a tackle. You're an idiot. (laughs) That is what... Three of the top five have been 13th overall picks. Every one of the top five tackles right now are first-round picks. It's not to say everybody. There's other good ones out there, but that that's the point. It's its a rare thing to have, and we have it. And he's not there right now, and, and that sucks and everything, and everybody's panicking, myself included. He's been playing really bad, and, and it's not to say you can't move him inside and kick him back outside, but it's a new position for him, and he's coming back from injury. Let him just push through the pain. I don't mean that literally in terms of push through the pain in his knees, suck it up, and deal with, with uh, brutal, debilitating in- injuries. I just mean push through the adversity. He'll get there. He'll figure it out. He's dealing with injury issues and learning a new position. Obviously, the talent is there. And if, if you have the opportunity to have two premier tackles in the NFL, you should do that rather than abandoning the plan after two weeks. That's, that's where I'm at with it right now. I've been very back and forth on this, but that's where I'm at with this right now. But here, here are, and, and this is funny too, this is why I like to go back and listen to it, because on Twitter yesterday when I was going around it, it sounded like the Packers were very like, you know, definitive on, of course, Elton is not going to be moved into guard, you bunch of idiots. Here's the actual quote, though. Are you as a coach weighing the challenge of him being in a position that he's played maybe the least at versus maybe he could just get his feet or his legs underneath him a little better if he was just a guard? Like, is that a conversation? Or Yeah, no, you're always you're always looking to put your best five out there, you know. And right now, I, I, I think Elton's, for us, best at right tackle. Um, and for him, you know, it, it's the challenge of, you know, left tackle or right tackle, you're going to be playing against the best D lineman on every team, uh, those edge guys. And... He's an alpha, he's a dog, and he's going to approach it every week. You know, he wants that on his shoulders. So again, absolutely not a certainty, right? He used several kind of wishy-washy words in there. Um, for right now, he said, he followed that up with, I think, while all the while acknowledging, you know, we were certainly having conversations about it. But uh, there's another follow-up question about that. So you just said that... Um made it pretty clear that um, Elton's the right tackle. By the way, 
the way the question is framed just annoys me because again everybody's pushing the idea that obviously he's the tackle and then the question is framed with you've made it very clear that he's your right tackle no <laughs> he didn't he, he said he, he i mean he, he made it clear that he's currently the right tackle which is obvious from from you know the fact that we've watched football and he is our right tackle but but the idea that he's that's not going to change that you know whatever it doesn't matter but it's just it as soon as i heard that i was like you come on man um you know, he has struggled a bit. I guess what gives you the confidence, or I can say the confidence, I understand the confidence. What gives you the belief that he is the best guy when, you know, maybe you could try Ash and put Elton at guard where he'd also then be the best guard? Yeah, we're, I mean, every week we're evaluating who's our best five, you know. So right now I think Elton's the guy for the right tackle job. Again, I and think. It's, like you said, or like I said earlier, it's just going to be just – week by week kind of watching him get better and going but yeah there there is discussion of putting Yash at right tackle but then again you're moving Yash to a new position and he's going to go through some growing pains too so um yeah that's it's in the in the discussion but and that that's the other part of this where it's like well obviously it would be better if we just put Yash there because we know he's a good tackle and put Elton at guard excuse me we put Elton at tackle because we know he's a good tackle what makes you think we can put Yash at tackle and he's going to be a good tackle? We're, we're taking two left tackles, putting him at right tackle. We don't know that. By the way, Elton's always been a good tackle and he's struggling right now. We don't know that he's not going to struggle at guard. That's not a certainty. He might struggle just as much there. I don't know exactly what the root cause of his issues are. But again, the the, the larger point here is they're very clearly, well, as he said, reevaluating every single week. And I have to assume there's going to be a point at which if Elton doesn't improve and this continues, they will be making a change. And Elton's going to stay on the line somewhere, but they seem to be open to options. Um, here, here's some more offensive line talk, but this is more geared, well, entirely geared toward the interior. Yeah, no, I, I think, you know, one guy I think that's been the most consistent is Runyon. He's done a really good job. Um, and Josh... He's getting better every single week. Uh, it's fun to watch those guys pull around and, and come off the ball. And, again, like Royce, he's getting better every week too. So it's those guys, you know, they we try and use them in different schemes to keep the defense on their toes, and they're doing a great job, you know, coming off the ball in those different aspects. So a lot of that could just be coach speak. You know, I mean, there's clearly a hierarchy of his favorite children. <laughs> you know, he comes out and is glowing about John Runyon. He's like, oh, and Josh, you know, he's he's getting better every week, and you know, he's doing all these things. And oh, yeah, Royce, Roy, yeah, he's getting better every week too. Same exact thing. All three of them are the exact same. It's no big deal. But but no, I mean, it's it's that seems to be, if I had to guess, the order at which they appreciate the offensive linemen that they have, which is probably also part of the discussion, as we would assume. That's the reason why fans feel this way too. The discussion isn't just who's the best right tackle. It's also what's the best situation at guard. You know, I mean, obviously we can upgrade guard. Well, I shouldn't say obviously, but you presume you can upgrade guard um, significantly because, not just because it's it's a good guard compared to a great guard, but because we kind of aren't super big fans of Royce. And, and for good reason. I mean, he's he's decent. He's not a liability, I wouldn't say. But he's definitely not, I don't think, uh, I don't know. It, it, it doesn't matter. But but again, the uh, the sixth round offensive guard, John Runyon is really an a, a underappreciated piece of this offense, of, of this team in general. And, and again, you know, you'd have to do your own evaluation if you wanted to, but according to PFF, his run blocking isn't necessarily elite. I personally have never really seen an issue, but I also noticed the, the one game that I really watched, he was usually partaking in double teams with Josh, uh, Josh Meyer. So it's kind of hard to, to get super excited about it. And a lot of times, Josh will kind of peel off and get up to that next level, but you know, I mean, it's it's hard to be like, oh, dang, he's so good. Look at how that guy didn't move when he and Josh both blocked him. But, I mean, John Runyon right now, sixth highest graded guard in terms of pass blocking. If you include run blocking, he's significantly lower. But um, that's what matters most. Still hilarious that James Daniels is still the number one. <laughs> the former Bear, James Daniels, they got rid of. would easily, and, and, and they need a guard right now. It just it cracks me up. Oh, there goes my light. Disaster. Royce, you know, we don't we don't need to worry about Royce so much. It's not a big deal. Uh, there's also a thing about Tunyon, but I'm just going to... Uh, we got to kind of pick up the pace a little bit with some of this stuff. Uh, bottom line, 
kind of coach speaky, you know, yeah, he's still battling back from injury and, um, you know, that's about it. Obviously very excited about him. Uh, next up, Joe Barry. First question, obviously, what are you going to do to fix this run defense? One of them two third end. Yeah, uh, you know, especially in the, in, the, um, in the third quarter there. You know, I think consistency is probably the biggest thing we're looking for. You know, I think um, we played dominant at times the other day for, you know, nine drives. And then uh, specifically, you know, the end, of, uh, the end of that seventh drive and then that eighth drive. Um, they got after us a little bit, and then we were obviously able to cool it down. And um, but yeah, I think the biggest thing is consistency. You know, we're still looking for um, obviously just that that complete game. You know, um, as I said, we played eleven drives the other day, and I think nine of them were were pretty darn good. Um, you know, other than the opening drive, giving up those three points. You know, they punted seven times. We got a takeaway, but those two drives, you know, we had some lapses and I mean, it, it was, you know, we turned it uh, into much more of a dramatic game than it needed to be. So that, I think that's an important answer um, because my perspective is that that's not, my, my recollection is that's not what happened. We, we just got whooped up and down the field all day long, but you know, just, just a cursory look over this, you know, the first drive again, they, they did do pretty well. A couple decent runs in there, got a field goal. Second time out, uh, Ramondre Stevenson, three yards, Ramondre Stevenson, two yards, incomplete pass, sack, punt. Uh, next time out, run for two, run for four, incomplete, punt. Look at the next drive. Pass, pass, four-yard run, negative two-yard run, incomplete, complete short, 62-yard, punt. The next drive, they did have a 15-yard run, but otherwise it was five-yard run, two-yard run, and then an incomplete pass a, and punt. Next drive, uh, pass, pass, eight-yard run, five-yard run, pass, sack, punt. Or actually, that was the uh, fumble recovery. I mean, is this, am I alone? Is this your recollection? This is not my recollection. This is, this is just straight-up dominance. But I think this is what happens sometimes. We just, we get annoyed when, like, those couple things don't, I mean, even, like, five-yard runs, as you're watching it, it can be annoying, especially when they stop him at the line and he's just standing there behind the line trying to find a place to go, and then he sneaks for five. It's like, come on, man the heck but when it ends in a sack punt oh well then third quarter you finally get one of those drives he was referring to after a sack you get a five yard run followed by a 14 yard run seven yard run four yard run um and then that's when you got the delay a game should be delay a game pass for a, a touchdown but to be fair you know as much as we can be annoyed by the the running which really there was just i mean there was a couple decent runs but it was just the 14 yard run was kind of the big one but before that, there was a 16-yard pass, and then there was a roughing the passer uh, on Kenny Clark for 15 yards. Suddenly, they're on their own 50-yard line. You know, all those runs, as, as great as they might be, that got them from the 50 to the 25. And then from there was the touchdown pass. And, and I think this is a big part of the reason why, as annoying as running is, it doesn't even compare to the passing. Even the penalty. I mean, it's a 15-yard penalty. And then they got another 25 rushing. But then the pass was a 25-yard pass. So it took them all that running to get to 25 yards and then one pass, 25-yard touchdown. I'm not saying it doesn't matter, but, but again, this is like the second time that they did this. And then the next time out, same thing, another lapse. This is now the fourth quarter. You got Ramondre for 12, Ramondre for 5, Ramondre for 17, Ramondre for 2. Then you got a completed pass for 21 yards. Then uh, Damian for 4 more. And then Damian for 5 more for a touchdown. So we had the first drive, and then there were back-to-back -back drives there that were a problem. After that, you get Damian for four, sack, uh, six-yard pass, punt. Then you get a two-yard run, five-yard run, two-yard run, punt. Then you get five-yard run, zero-yard run, incomplete pass, punt. And that was it. So he's right. Again, as, as much as my recollection is this defense is trash, even if you say that their runs were largely successful, even on, you know... A five-yard run's a great run, right, but it ended in a punt. Even on a lot of these, you know, again, the last drive that went three and up, there was a five-yard run on that one. You don't want them to get five-yard runs, but this is where, you know, running and passing and even explosive plays running aren't the same as explosive plays passing. A 10-yard run is great. A 20-yard pass is better. Why? Because it's 20 yards. <laughs> That's why.
you know, the, the, the series before that in fourth down, Damian Harris had a four yard run, not the most dominant thing in the world, but a four yard runs a good run, but they punted. It was a three and out the series before where they, you know, had, uh, I think they got one first down on it. Uh, there was a, a one eight yard run, one five or eight yard run, but that's it. That's all they got. That was aside from that, there were some passes and some incompletions and whatnot. And that was the, the sack fumble recovery. So yeah, I mean, there, there were, there were three, three times only in this entire game that the defense had enough lapses for them to actually get down the field and get some points. And the final one was a relatively short field, not, not that short, but they, they did start on their 35. And the time before that, again, you had one pass followed by a 15 yard penalty. So, you know, after one completion, they're already at their 50. So a lot of kind of shooting yourself in the foot. And, the, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting, too, to hear Joe Barry say, we just don't have the consistency we need. And it's, it's like, well, you're right. You do need more consistency. But we're <laughs> kind of talking about you want that perfect game, which, which he said. You're looking for that perfect game. Um, and, and really, when you look at what it was, you really realize how much of an offensive issue this was. You know, I mean, yeah, there was the, there was the pick six in there and everything. But um, for a lot of reasons, it really shouldn't have been this big of a deal. I mean, they, they managed 17 points, uh, and, and, and I, uh, in a normal football game, uh, this, in this era of football, sub-20 points is a heck of a defensive performance. So the fact that we're beating up our defense for 17 points, I know it was 24 on the box score, but pick six is not the defense's fault. Um, that's not that bad of a day. And yeah, the, the run defense does need to get cleaned up. I'm not, I'm not excusing it. I'm just saying my memory of it is, is worse than it actually was. Uh, snippet on Saquon. I'll save that. He just kind of gloats all over how great he is. Uh, another thing about, do you not care about stopping the run? He says it, it's the most important or not the most important, but that's where it all starts. I think a lot of that is coach speak. I think there is a much bigger focus on stopping the pass. So I'm just going to kind of leave that alone. Uh, but here's his comments on Rudy Ford. And it, it was kind of cool because his face kind of lit up when, when the comment first came up about Rudy Ford, but here's what he had to say about him. Years and, um, Rudy was the, the newest guy that had to go in. He was thrust into, you know, unfortunately we lost Adrian. And uh, it doesn't matter if you've been here one week, one month, or a year. Um, you're the next man up. And like I tell you guys all the time, we, we, we take the approach that, you know, we don't have backups. We have starters in waiting because you never know when your opportunity is going to happen. And, uh, you know, I always credit not only the player, but, you know, Coach Gray and, and Coach Downer do a great job in that room, as does our entire staff. And um, they've prepped the guy since the day he's got here with, you know, extra morning meetings and post-practice meetings and um, getting him right and ready for you never know when that, that opportunity happens. So, um, and Rudy, Rudy came in and did a heck of a job for us. It was great. Kind of just wanted that last piece. But, yeah, no, it's – it's. Um to see the excitement that they had for, for him. And, and again, it's the fact that they're saying, yeah, it's next man up mentality, but the fact that he was the next man up is, is also, again, pretty impressive. And then uh, finally, a snippet on Rashawn Gary. Kind of the question was more tiered toward uh, run defense, but um, just, just anytime they gloat about Rashawn is a good, good opportunity. Oh, I think Rashawn Gary is as complete a football player as there is in this league. You know, at, at, uh, I mean, I think he's... Uh, I don't know what the what the what what you guys feel, but um, I mean to me, he's he's a dominant player. Um, in no matter you know every down, um, you know of course in our league, you know especially with with those positions with those those rushers that they get classified as, you know a lot of times those guys are just you know they're pass rushers, and you hope to you know get whatever you can get out of them in the run game. Um, Rashawn Gary is as, as, as violent and physical, you know, an edge player on, on first and second down as he is a violent and, you know, productive pass rusher on third down. So um, I think he's as complete as there is in this league. And then uh, just one clip from uh, Rich Passaccia. There, there are several little things that we could listen to, but this was, you, you may be have seen this on Twitter or whatnot, but it, it's so cool talking about Dallin. I didn't realize this was, his thing, D Dallin Levitt is essentially playing in the wrong era. And the fact that he was a Raider makes perfect sense. Although I don't know if the Raiders still have those kinds of players, but um, he's, he's one of those guys that just kind of got a screw loose. It's funny. If you Google Dallin Levitt and just look at his pictures, every single one of his pictures, 
he just looks like a guy that's got some demons, you know? Like, he's just, he's an angry person that needs football to kind of mellow him out. You know what I mean? Like, if he didn't have the opportunity to run down the field and smash somebody's skull, he'd be a menace to society. But here's, here is our glimpse into uh, Dallin Levitt. Yeah, I mean, he's that, he's that guy, right? He's the inner, inner driver bunny. He's the, you know, Tasmanian devil. He's just one of those guys that um, has a great sense of his job, has a great sense of his role and what he's being asked to do. And you know, he plays in a way in which um, I think people respect, you know, his work. He's an angry worker, and, and, um, but he's, he's really a bright guy. Some of his things, I think, are probably calculated. Um, he's well-prepared. And I think the players, especially the younger players, um, they see that, how he prepares. And, you know, he has to make a lot of calls in the meetings. So I think the guys get a certain level of comfort. Um, I know Pat does, that he's going to put them in the right protection at the right time, and hopefully he can keep doing that. Does he piss guys off a little bit, too? From What's that? That? Does he piss guys off on the other team a little bit from uh, that? He pisses me off a lot. <laughs> and, um, so I'm sure he, he gets after them a little bit as well. So I think the first game the official came over and said, what is the matter with number six? <laughs> It's the start of the game. It's just how he is. So, so I, I, I really like that. And I'm glad that we have a guy like that. I mean, he, he's just, he's a loose cannon. Um, Dallin Levitt is, you know, he's, he's, um, he's a violent player. He's a physical player. And we need that, you know. I mean, there, there's so much, I don't know. I don't want to use the word finesse because it's probably overused. But, but there is an element of that. Like, we want these technicians. And, and I think once in a while it's not a bad idea to have a guy that's just kind of, I don't know, little, little, little different, a little bit off his rocker a little bit, you know? And, um, again, loose cannon is probably the best way to put it. I mean, even Rich Bisaccia kind of has this attitude of, I can't control him, you know, asked if, if he gets under other teams' skin and he, you know, he, yeah, he, he kind of gets under mine as well. And the fact that the first game of the season, a referee came, comes over, walks over to the special teams coordinator and says, what the heck is wrong with number six? What is his freaking problem? So I, I personally will be watching him a lot closer. I know I've seen him a couple times kind of get down there, but uh, that's one of those things where you got to go back and look at the All-22 and just stare at him and see what he's doing out there because I, I want to see that in action. Uh, Matt LaFleur actually commented on that, so we'll go to that next. I've only got two clips from Matt LaFleur, uh, who absolutely hates that they're going to London, apparently. But here is Matt LaFleur on Dallin Lovett. In the game. Matt, Rich described uh, Dallin Lovett as the Tasmanian devil yesterday and said a ref recently came up to him and said, what's wrong with number six? You have to have a little crazy in you if you play like he does on special teams. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, all those guys have a little bit... um, in order to run down there with that, the reckless abandon and knowing that it's, I mean, let's face it, it's, it is a, um, one of the more violent parts of the game, obviously running down on kickoff, uh, punt, whatever it may be. But, uh, now Dallin's been a huge, huge piece for just changing the culture in our special teams. And and that's the other piece of it too, is changing the culture, bringing that energy and and just kind of, and that's what Rich brought him over there to be, a tone setter. You know, it's it's not just these guys just kind of gliding down the field and, well, we got to stay in our lanes and do all this stuff. It's, you know, let, watch Dallin. It, 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 yes, it's about being assigned mature and all that stuff, but it's also about, you know, <laughs> there, there's just a violence to it. There is a mentality here. It's an important part of this. Um, here, here's just a snippet of Matt LaFleur, and he, he did the same thing. Um, I don't know, just any time asked about London, he just, he does not like it. Not- the, the, I should, the question was, is this week specifically difficult for you? I'm not going to give you my honest answer. <laughs> I'd rather refrain. It feels like a Thursday night game for us as coaches, uh, just in terms of all the preparation you got to do. And um, you just, but you just do it. So it is what it is. Aaron Rodgers commented on that and basically said, look, coaches are so oriented toward, you know, uh, the routine that any little, any little minor change in routine and they lose their mind. But, you know, basically he'll get over it. We're all looking forward to it. It's going to be great. Uh, I got three clips from Aaron Rodgers and then we'll be on our way. We'll start with uh, eh, 
we'll save the best for last. Let's let's do offensive line because we already talked about it. I mentioned he kind of chimed in also about getting the best five and and kind of reiterating that it's not a hundred percent set in stone. Although we do have five guys, and and that's probably how it's going to stay. Does that best five on the offensive line, in your mind, involve Yash at right and Elton inside? Yeah, I'm not sure. You know, I think Yash has played so much at left tackle for us. He hasn't really played a whole lot of right. Um, I like the five we got right now. So that's that's more or less it. Again, it's it's very, I don't know, we'll see. But this is what we got. I'm happy with what we got, and we're, we're going to ride it out. We'll see how it goes. I think that's the the proper alignment of how we should see this with, with the uh, full understanding that they're really going to give this the best chance that they can because Elton Jenkins being a premier tackle for this team is unbelievably important in the long run. Um, here's another question that I just kind of appreciated because I didn't think of it, darn it, but it's it's kind of a the the answer isn't even interesting. I just wanted to talk about it personally. Stadium. Oh, I thought I gave the question in there. Um, they're asking, will there be a London leap? A Lambo leap in London. I think that's the coolest freaking thing ever. But here's what Roger said. I haven't seen how high the walls are, but might need to boost like uh, Hunter did for Mason against the what was that the Lions at one time mm-hmm. or the Niners? Which one was it? Lions? Yeah. Uh, look, they got great fans over there. I'm, I'm excited about the interaction. Tom's got all these you know media request lines up for, lined up for me, so I'm sure we'll have some fun with some of those interactions. And excited, to, really excited to go. Out. Anyways, um, that that will be. I mean, it's 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 a historic thing, and it makes me wonder if if it can be done. And I'm I'm gonna look at some pictures and stuff of the the game and see if there's anything weird about the walls. But the who's gonna be the player that does the first ever Lambo leap in London? Oh, actually, I'm I'm looking at some uh, pictures here. You might need a boost. I think you might need a little bit of a boost to get up there. I hope they do it though. They they might just not do it, but I hope they do. Just I mean, for the fans out there and everything, it's a cool experience. Um, I think they, they need to find a way to do it. Although it depends on the picture you look at. I was looking at one where the, they were kicking a field goal and it looked like really tall walls. Now I'm looking from another angle. It's like, they can jump that. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. I thought it was a great question though. Finally, this is the one that's getting the most, um, attention right now. Aaron Rodgers kind of asked about his retirement and how much does Dobbs and Watson play into that? I was, I was honestly stunned by this answer. Uh, we'll just play it and then talk about it. I think there's going to be a lot of benefits to be reaped from from those guys. So I'm sure long after I'm gone, those guys are going to have an opportunity to, to be here and play and play in the second contracts. But it's about development, really, for them. It's about their mental approach, especially, like I said yesterday, year one to two can be a big jump. Two to three can be an even bigger jump. So it's just understanding what it means to be a pro and figure that out. And, and hopefully, I think every young player should lean on an older guy and get some advice. I think as older guys, we love to to share the mistakes that we made with, our, with the young guys so they don't repeat those things. And things that work for us as a young player, things that didn't work, things we'd like to see them do, I think is really important passed on that knowledge. But look, my decision when it comes down to it will be... Hold on. Right here, in my brain, everything made perfect sense up to this point. Because in my mind, honestly, I thought Rodgers is probably gone. I, I really thought, I thought, as in I'm changing my mind right now, he, he, there's a good chance he's gone after this year. I know most people don't agree with that, but that was kind of where I was at. At the very least, he played one more year and then he's out of here. And it really just came down to, I just think he wants to be retired. That's it. it it's not, you know, it, well, no, because Tom Brady. Dude, come on. You, you're not going to subject yourself to an entire year of, of football when you want to be free and to go out and do out whatever you want and have fun and enjoy your life because of Tom Brady. Come on. You're not going to take off and, and you, you're not going to retire because you don't want to be on the same stage as Tom Brady. I don't, I don't, need, I don't even understand that. Right? But, but what was his answer up to this point? As soon as he was asked about Christian Watson, he, he, the first thing he says is, they're going to be great long after I'm gone. So his, his first when asked about them working together is they're going to be good and I'm not going to be here kind of answer. Then he goes on to talking about their development and what they need to do in the future to be great for a long time here in Green Bay, just making it sound like they're going to be here and I'm not. Then he says, finally, after talking about that and, you know, about us old guys and the new guys that are taking over and all that stuff, again, makes perfect sense to me from a guy that thinks that he's going to be gone probably after this year or, or at least in two years. 
He says, as far as me, my decision is going to come down to, and I just thought that that what I just said is going to be it. It's going to be based on how I'm feeling and, you know, do, do I still love the game and do I, you know, how much do I want to be? It just comes down to how awesome is football compared to how awesome is retirement and which one wins out. But that's not his answer here. Uh, obviously, the physical part, the mental part, seeing where the team is at. Look at the defense. A lot of guys are signed for multiple years now. That seems to be intact for a while. They've got a good core on the offensive line, some young guys. Uh, obviously, two great backs who are still under contract. There's some moving pieces, but, you know, that'll factor in for sure. But seeing the development of those guys... Uh, you know, can't help but be a part of the decision. What? <laughs> that uh, that kind of kind of shocked me a little bit. His decision. I mean, he says, you know, the the mental, physical, whatever. He brushes past that pretty quickly, and then goes immediately into, you know, look at the quality of the defense. How good is our defense? That matters. How good is this offensive line? And then says the development of these guys is not going to hurt that decision. Which is interesting for for two reasons. The first thing, I mean, the the second thing, I guess, since we're already talking about it, that came to my mind was how crazy it is that like whether or not Rodgers comes back is partially, if not largely, going to be dependent on how good these guys are. Like if they really blow up and are top tier wide receivers, that's really going to weigh on Rodgers to be like, dude, we got to run this back, man. This is awesome. And if they suck, it's like I don't I don't want to do this. This is I'm not babysitting these guys. That that's a big part of it. But my first thought was what that kind of says about how he feels about the wide receivers, not including the two young guys, right? In other words, if I'm going to stay here, these two better step up because there's really no other reason to stay as far as my weapons as a whole. So, I mean, there's a a ton of lip service about Lazard and Tunyon and Randall and whatever. But if, if that was really the core, if we're really talking Lazard is my guy and Randall is, is my guy, and, you know, who knows, maybe Sammy, probably not coming back. But it wouldn't matter as much. You know, if, if, if basically whatever Dobbs is now and whatever Christian can maybe be at some point is, is good enough. You know, if he can just be MVS light and Dobbs can kind of just continue doing what he's doing, we'll be fine. In other words, it won't factor in at all. So I, I was just kind of surprised by that answer that, that basically his decision is very largely going to come down to the quality of the team, which I guess, it, I guess does make sense. Right, because again, it, what is the factor? It's how awesome is retirement compared to how awesome is football. Well, how awesome football is kind of depends how much you're awesome compared to how much you suck. So, if, if as if we needed another reason to really want the Packers to be good, it sounds to me like Aaron Rodgers absolutely will not come back if he thinks that this team is not really a com- competitor. Which again makes sense, but it just uh, I guess I guess it wasn't that black and white for me prior to him saying it. and and his desire to come back. Now I don't know how the Super Bowl affects that. Maybe if we win, no matter what, he leaves. Maybe if we win, no matter what, he comes back. I don't know exactly his thought on that. Like, well, we won, I want to repeat. Or, you know, I want to walk off into the sunset after the Super Bowl. Or we we narrowly missed, that's it. I don't want to do this anymore compared to we narrowly missed. I think we're close. Let's try it again. But no, I, w- I was just kind of surprised that that his answer was less personal in terms of my quality of life. You know, 90, I, I really thought 80, 90% of the decision is just going to come down to how much I want to be retired. You know, the, the, the team will be what it is, but do, do I love football and want to play it, or do I just really want to be retired? And again, his, his answer was largely, we'll see how good the team is. If the team's awesome, I'm coming back. <laughs> so anyways, uh, that's it. That's all I got. Um, the heck is the day today? We, we, we're going to start turning our attention to the Giants starting tomorrow. We've got uh, three days, two days to cover that. So that's what we will do. In the meantime, have a great day. I will talk to you tomorrow. Bye-bye.